Welcome to, uh, to my talk. Um, my, name is, uh, my name is Daniel Olivia. I'm an engineer here at MinIO. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do a talk on writing machine learning pipelines against object storage. So I'm going to start with the, like, the premise of the problem that I'm trying to address with this talk. Right? So nowadays, you know, uh, machine learning is becoming like a very relevant area. And it's been growing. And it's building on top of the history that big data has been bringing to the table. So what's happening right now is you have these machine learning engineers working on their pipelines. And traditionally, they, they're working on their own personal computer, which may have some CPUs, GPUs. There's a data set laying around on that machine. And they're, they're so used to having it in their local storage. They're bringing their tools and building all these machine learning uh, algorithms, and, right? So they're perfecting it and saying, okay, I have a model, this will train, this will work, that's it. Now, the, the problem here is that after they have uh, actually built this pipeline, they, what they will do is they will grab all this stuff and throw it over the wall. And throw it over the wall to who? To the DevOps guy. And this guy is in charge of actually taking care of grabbing these files. Sometimes he'll just get a bunch of Py files, some source code, and he needs to figure out how to containerize it, put it in a machine, run it on top of the infrastructure. And that has been traditionally the model, right? Data scientists, machine learning engineers have been building the pipeline. And then they, but they don't take account into, okay, how this is algorithm is actually going to be deployed at the, at the end, how it's actually going to be scaled. And that is part of the problem. Now, when we start coming into more modern machine learning pipelines, the problem starts becoming a little bit heavier, right? What I mean by that? So once you have built all these machine learning models, my slides are completely out of sync. Um, so now, if you're building for a larger machine learning model, let's say the two trendiest models right now are both diffusion models or uh, large language models. For example, if you were trying to train uh, your own version of Llama, right? They, they publish the paper, the data set is public, and that data set is 4.71 terabytes in size. That's not a data set that you can even fit in a laptop, right? So even if the engineer was trying to work with this data set, he will have a hard time. He will need a bigger computer to fit that. And moreover, when you're training on top of this, you need expensive type of nodes that have, you know, either a lot of GPUs or TPUs or HPUs to train on top of these algorithms. And that is the problem. So as this algorithms are scaling in size, right? And no, it's not only a problem of the data set that uh, can no longer fit into the engineer's machine. Also, this data set might be also too big to actually be loading onto every single node that you'll be using for training. So that is the sort of the problem that I'm trying to address with this conversation, which is, okay, now if you're designing the pipeline and you're entirely basing it um, against object storage, uh, it will, the problem will start uh, solving on, on, on of itself coming in from inception, from the engineer's, engineer's side, into the production side. So what's the main difference uh, that I'm trying to assess initially? OK, so this training infrastructure, whether it's a bunch of uh, GPUs, or you're using tensor processing units, or Havana processing units, uh, it's actually very expensive. However, storage infrastructure usually tends to go on the cheaper side, right? Companies build a storage infrastructure to match their use case. You may be building for very large data sets because you are doing analytics on large big data. So you may actually go for solid state drives, hard disk drives, those are cheaper and deeper, right? Perhaps you're training, you're training on the cutting edge and you need NVMe because you're training at very high speed. You can build your storage infrastructure for that. But then you can completely se separate it, right? And at Minaya, we've been making the case since the Hadoop days, since the big data days, where is uh, the coupling compute and storage actually allows you to go into different directions with how you want to treat your algorithms, right? In this case, you don't no longer need to build a very expensive infrastructure. You don't need to make sure that every single node can fit these very large data sets, right? If you were doing uh, self-driving car training, multi-petabyte data sets won't fit into every single node. It's, it's no longer a possibility that if the scientists assume that the data sets will be present locally, it will actually work out. So now moving on to the solution. So, oh, well, that, that's uh, comparing these two, right? So the compute infrastructure tends to be pricier than the storage infrastructure. So that's, let, let's actually leverage the storage infrastructure to reduce the cost of training. So the, if, you, if we look at the state of a, a basic machine learning pipeline, almost every single machine learning pipeline is, is built out of a stage of extracting data, right? Then someone extracts the data. This may be coming out of production logs, right? Millions and millions of production logs. And after that, after you extract the data that you care, you pre-process it, right? Not everything in the log is relevant to the algorithm. 
So now you need to take that, put it into a, a file that makes sense to the machine learning pipeline that you're training, and run, then start running it to a training loop, right? So the training loop will be crunching through the data. It will go into evaluation, be if it's at this stage the training is done, no, okay, I'll go back and keep training. At some point when you're done and the evaluation says this is a great model, you, you want to deploy it to, machine, to production, and you want, then want to go and acquire more data. So this is also what is known as machine learning operations, MLOps, right? So if you take this algorithm and you start standardizing on this model, you can actually make uh, every stage an independent component that can be optimized and um, version around. So now why is it important to build this, this sort of, um, uh, or follow this pattern when you're developing a machine learning algorithm? So pretty much, let's say you have a version one model and you build state-of-the-art model that can recognize zeros and ones. So it's like great, you, you have your engineers uh, build it, deploy it, and it's working amazing. It's, however, every now and then someone comes, comes up and they invent a new digit. Number two gets invented. Your model doesn't recognize it. It's just an ugly zero, right? So now if you're keeping acquiring data and you start noticing, okay, there's new type of data that I need to, be the, the, to detect through the machine learning algorithm, if the pipeline has been established, just rerunning it through the pipeline with the new data, uh, whether it's labeled or unlabeled, we'll be able to actually have the model start recognizing this properly, right? So that, that's why it's so important to have a proper machine learning pipeline um, philosophy. And then how, that, how does that go into the uh, uh, machine learning, uh, into the open source paradigm and for the data scientists means that uh, they can start building these, these modules that says, okay, this is a module that will only extract data, right? I only did this once. And I, I have two types of the, uh, building, extracting data multiple versions, I'm improving this over time. So uh, go, going into the stack, how you can actually build this, for example, what, for a data scientist, what he will care is that he can work this on his laptop, right? So usually data scientists, machine learning engineers like working everything locally. Here an example is, I'm using PyTorch to build an algorithm, right? So they, they, they actually like to say, okay, I'll be extracting my data through pandas, reading it out of some sample, and then I'll be pre-processing with PyTorch itself. I'll be training on top of uh, PyTorch and such, everything, right? So the acquiring data is not relevant for me as a data scientist. I only care about how I'm designing my algorithm. Now, here in all this mix, I'm using uh, one core technology, Jupyter, right? So, but the, um, I'm using it as a notebook just to model a single stage of the pipeline, right? But the, the fact that I'm, uh, how I can all glue all of this together is I can bring another open source project called Elida, right? Elida is actually, great for actually taking each of these individual notebooks and gluing them into a single pipeline. Now, the advantage of doing it this way is that now the DevOps guy can grab this algorithm and just hit run on top of a distributed training infrastructure such as Airflow or Qflow. And now we can actually transform all of these individual notebooks into separate containers and have them do their job, right? And now we, we, we just made it so that as long as the data scientist or the machine learning engineer is designing and working each stage of the pipeline as a separate component that can be taken out and put in, uh, it, it makes it easy to run. So now um, this could keep evolving, right? So I just said, well, I, we just run it uh, on Airflow. Of course, uh, I can also take it and run it into Qflow, but then I start replacing the components that matter with the, uh, with the other components that will actually go to the scale that I need. Let's say if I'm running with production logs, maybe I'm, I need to query a multi-petabyte data set with Trino, extract that data set and put it in some other location. Then bring a, a more heavy lifting uh, processing framework like Spark to actually crunch the data into the format that I care about and then I keep my, you know, the machine learning algorithm running on PyTorch, that's the original one. I do the evaluation on PyTorch. When it's ready, I put it somewhere, and then I have KSERF run, right? And then I build my pipeline so that Kafka keeps capturing more data. So the algorithm is always ready and up to speed. So, but if you see here, I have all these arrows, we're missing the glue, right? So the glue that we're proposing here to, uh, to this solution is actually the object storage, the MinIO layer. Because if you see where you keep the data, you could just keep it on object storage, right? And then as you are extracting from multiple petabytes of logs, you're, you are, and you're extracting the data that you only care about through your ETL, you need to put it back, you can put it back in object storage. You don't need to actually have it on a long running process or any long running node, right? Next stage can just go and pick up from where, where the previous stage left, right? And then just take the data that is sitting there. It doesn't matter the size anymore, right? Object storage is meant for scale, right? And we just take the data, we go to the next stage, and we continue. And this is the, 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 the matter point 
uh, of building uh, the machine learning pipelines in, with object storage in the mind that if the engineer is no longer having to worry about, okay, I'm just going to build this as a single like notebook that does everything, and someone else will figure out how to productize this, we're just wasting time. But if the machine learning engineer from start, he's, he says, okay, I'll take an object storage solution that I can run locally, and start running it and working against it, right? And it's even better because I'm, I'm just getting used to like, maybe sometimes the data set won't fit on my laptop, and I'll be working with a data set that's actually on company servers or right, on some other cloud provider, and I'll just be reading against that and working with it. it just, it's just gonna make it so much more productive. So the, if, if I were to summarize what I just told you, but in a vertical way, right? So let's say you were working with Llama again, right? Very trendy large language models right now, like extremely trendy. And that's a 4.71 terabyte uh, data set size, 800 billion documents. So if you wanted to train on top of this, you can just put that on object storage, right? And then go and work with it, pull the images as you need, convert them into arrays, and then when, once you have uh, reprocessed all those documents, these are web scrapes, uh, you put them on, on object storage. Whichever technology you use to build that doesn't need to actually care that the next stage will come online, it, and it just needs to agree on the format. Then it just goes through the formats, right? You could uh, use a, a binary format, like TensorFlow has this TF record format for storing in binary, but you could, might as well use T, uh, NumPy records or anything that fits the algorithm. The next algorithm can come and just start grabbing those training, right? And then this that gets something very interesting, like if you were training one of these trendy large language models, it's also something you cannot train on a single node, right? Uh, famously, Facebook said, or Meta said, when they published this model, they said, well, we trained this on 2,000 GPUs and it took us a week. And it's like, okay, how many, no how many GPUs can I decently fit in a single box? Eight. That means they actually had plenty of nodes. So this opens up the gate for distributed training, right? Distributed training becomes easy if the whole algorithm was built on top of object storage. Because now I can just keep running nodes and then as I'm distributing the training load, I say each node will be taking a different part of the data set, a different batch, and they'll start training and training and training, uh, returning the results to, to object storage, averaging out and continuing on the next epoch. It, will, it, it makes it trivial to actually train large scale uh, machine learning models. So, yeah, now I'll do a small demonstration, right? So that's something I want to include so that it doesn't look like I'm, it's just like a, a nice proposal. It's something that you can actually perform right now. So uh, I like to start with my, uh, my JupyterLab, right? JupyterLab is it's a nice tool just for running and organizing a variety of different types of notebooks, right? Every data scientist is pretty used to this uh, uh, technology. Now what I'm build, bringing in is the Elida notebook, right? So Elida notebook is a nice way uh, to actually graph and, and design pipelines. If you see here, I have a, a pipeline that says, well, I have a stage that extracts, pre-process, trains, evaluates, and then deploys. So let's, see, let's, imagine, let's look at my, uh, I don't know, which one is the more interesting one? Training is the more interesting one. If I open one, any one of these stages, I can immediately see what's going on, right? So I'm designing my, uh, my pipeline to assume that things will, get big, will be given to me through environment. But of course, I'm defaulting to some values. And as a data scientist, I'm just making a mess here and running, testing things here. They're working, yes, this works. Then I'll do this, I'll do that. I design my neural architecture. Should, uh, it's actually on a separate file. So I have my, my neural architecture here. It's just like a very simple neural network with four layers, right? This is what I'm using. But this is all things that as a data scientist, uh, I find natural to do. I could even have the neural architecture in the notebook. Nothing's making me, like making it in a Python file. But what's interesting here is at the end of the day, if, if, even if I say, okay, I'll take, build all this, this stage output, is it gonna stay on my local or is it just gonna be uh, placed on all, to object storage? And then the next stage, its starting point will be to make the assumption that the pipeline will notify me where should I be grabbing my, my model or my input and continuing from there. So the, the Elida as an open source product makes this trivial. Right? It makes it very nice. And now you can actually go to your data scientist and make a strong case. I want you to build the machine learning algorithms following this design or this pattern, right? So that now once when you are over productizing it, it's actually easier and simpler. Now, something really nice about uh, Elida itself on, on, on its own is that if you want to connect it to a distributed training platform, such as Airflow or Qflow, right? So two of the most popular right now for distributed training, uh, it's, it's as trivial as saying, okay, if, if this is a pipeline of type Airflow, uh, Qflow, I'll just hit it run, select a runtime. Right here I have a Qflow runtime, and that's it. 
Now, even though I'm working on localhost, right, uh, I may have a Qflow running on local, who knows, uh, or I have the company Qflow, let's say, online, and I'll just uh, go into that environment and start seeing how the pipeline is actually performing. So I've turned this into a, a, a tool that I can use to work locally, right, into actually getting the machine learning engineer involved into actually building and productizing its own pipeline that he's building so that he can see, okay, I'm building and I'm working against like a small big storage, whether it's on my laptop or it's uh, on the company uh, infrastructure. And I'll use this one and learn. So what things, are, what things are working for me that if I were to run this in the final product are not actually working for anyone. I can go and explore and see the extraction process, the training, the logs. These are some of the nice things that Qflow brings to the table. But of course, this is where the DevOps guy will actually come into place. He will actually care about how do I run this? How do I run this continuously? And of course, if this pipeline is already like built into, I can also run experiments on top of it. So, but I don't need to worry about, uh, okay, this guy said that he needs a whole data set for the extraction. I don't know if he needs the same data set on the next stage and on the next stage and on the next stage. That is a problem that the DevOps guy doesn't need to care. He only needs to care that he's setting the proper access, right, to the pipeline for it to run. And once that part is ready, it just keeps going, right? And uh, for, the, for the last stage, of course, and in this, um, something very interesting uh, from this is that if, if there's some output from these pipelines, uh, even the Qflow is to, uh, uses object storage to uh, store the intermediate stages of information between each different pipeline into object store. And you can even go to object store and look at the, all the individual runs, right? So actually, this is the wrong location. So I'm, I'm using a, a bucket called ML operations, MLOps. And I'm, I have all my runs here. Every time I've run this pipeline, everything is, is actually kept, kept, in, kept here as an evidence of what was used to run the pipeline at that point in time, what's the output of every of these stages in the machine learning pipeline. So it's, it's actually an, uh, an experiment that, that can be reproduced, right? It's not, it's not also that the DevOps did something and suddenly uh, the, the result it was pretty good, but no one knows what hyperparameters they use in that run, right? So that's also taken care of by actually structuring your pipelines in a way that's uh, repetitive, right? I have an interesting story that we once uh, trained on, on my previous startup, uh, a very cool uh, model, right? It was the state-of-the-art model for the product. And I never backed up the hyperparameters. So then after a month, I was like, I'm, I'm gonna retrain this. I would just fire up a VM with some GPUs and hit train. And oh, it looks great. Uh, deploy to production, and then it goes to production and it has the worst performance ever, worst performance. And then everyone's panicking and it's like, let's go back to the previous model. And I was like, I don't know where's the previous model. I was not putting it in anywhere, right? I was just taking it out of the machine, as, uh, and I was a machine learning engineer, right? Taking it out of the machine, putting it in the container on my laptop and putting it uh, over there. So now we lost it. So we had to actually go into the production containers and sneak through the Docker socket and extract the model to recover that, right? So, but if I knew what were the hyperparameters that I used, I knew the data set that I used to train, but I didn't know the hyperparameters I used to, for the previous iteration of that model. I could have replicated that training, and I didn't, right? So having a well-organized uh, machine learning uh, workflow is quite important, and making sure that it's uh, auditable. People can go and see what happened when you train that, right? So here I have uh, like a training, Thingy. Well, actually, let's look at the uh, yeah training. I'm just going to download this file, and I'll just explore what happened. And this is very nice. Oh, there was an error on this run. <laughs> you can even see the notebook as the output of the notebook that we have run on that stage, right? So very easy for the, you can go to the data scientist and be like, here, here's the notebook. This is your code, how you actually wrote it. It failed this way, right? So you go fix it and let me know when it's ready, and we'll commit a new version of it. So it makes it very transparent. To, and very scalable, right, to actually build machine learning uh, pipelines this way. And that is kind of like the, the problem that I'm trying to address by proposing to actually build your machine learning pipelines in a very structured way through, through uh, machine learning operations and gluing them through object storage. So, yeah, so that's, that's kind of like the gist of it. So, yeah. So MLSOPS is a development philosophy. So th this is where you bring to the, your company and say, okay, Stop building everything into a single notebook. Start structuring into separate stages. We want to see it in separate stages. And even if the separate stages, you know, even if people develop them as separate Python files, putting them in containers is quite simple. You can bring tools like Elida to actually make this simple, right? Um, so 
uh, you should always keep in mind that machine learning models may go stale. So we saw that when machine learning, the, in the initial machine model that I had that didn't recognize the digit two, needed to modernize. So if you have everything structured as a pipeline, you just hit rerun, right? It will go great, grab the latest data set that's available and go train and deploy a new model if it uh, passes your validation. Um, storage infrastructure is way cheaper than compute infrastructure. So uh, we've, we've seen this from the big data days. Disaggregating compute and storage is actually key, right? Compute is burstable. You can go to any cloud provider and just create burstable compute. But storage, you know, data doesn't, cannot go away. Data is not elastic. Data just likes to grow. And the beauty about data is it grows at a predictable state. So you can actually go and invest into building like a decent storage infrastructure, a very modern data lake based on object storage, for example. And then that will actually address that, you know, if next month there's a shinier, better way of training a new GPU, a new Tesla processing unit, you can just go leverage that, right? So you're not bound by the infrastructure that you decided to build last year. And building all machine learning uh, components and re, uh, as usual components have advantages. We saw people can just come and be like, okay, this is too slow because you're downloading and running everything to a pandas data frame. I'll just replace this with Presto, right? Or you're crunching these numbers with Python, I'll just replace that with Spark. So it's every component, every stage of the pipeline can actually be optimized and made and iterated in separately as the rest of the pipeline. You know, no one needs to go and learn and understand the whole pipeline itself. And finally, uh, the life cycle of the machine learning models is quite important. They always need to be iterating, right? Or they will go sell. That was, that, that's kind of a redundant endpoint. So that's my talk. So thank you for coming along. And if I have any questions right now from you, I would like to take them. Yes, it, it all, okay. Uh, should she ask the question on the microphone? Yeah, <laughs> for the recording, yeah. Uh, do you have any data on uh, how the behavior, the performance uh, changes with the size of the model or the data? It, it all depends on the model that you're training. So like if you're doing uh, like a naive based model on top of Spark, uh, you may not, you, I mean Spark already trains in a distributed fashion, so uh, the only advantage you'll see is if the storage is, is feeding data as fast as the compute needs it. But if you're training, let's say, a deep learning algorithm, right? So one of the biggest uh, bottlenecks is the PCI bus. The PCI bus and let's say the GPUs are trying to pull data uh, from the NVMe from the local storage into the GPUs so that it then can be computed. That's usually a bottleneck, right? And then the other part is, okay, maybe you're bringing the data over like the network, right? Through an NFS or a NAS storage. And that's also like a bottleneck, right? So if the storage layer is not doing perform, is not performant enough, that quickly becomes a bottleneck. However, if you have like a very powerful, let's say tensor processing unit, like a TPU, and you make sure that your data is pre-processed and, and batched just right so that the batches can be loaded very quickly from object storage, right? And that's important in building on top of something that's cloud native, right? So in this case, uh, MinIO is one of the greatest choices for that. But every cloud provider will offer also object storage in, in that location. So if, you, if, you're, uh, if your algorithm is structured enough, you, I mean, compute you can always increase, right? So I don't have any precise numbers, but I can tell you that uh, they actually unblock one of the biggest contention points on this uh, compute infrastructure. Yeah. All right, any other questions? All the questions you have, you want? All right, so thank you. And have a good open source summit. <laughs>